John Delaney could run anything, as far as I could. Uh, you know, John Delaney could run UEFA easily. He could run FIFA, as far as I'm concerned. Better because, than Mr. Blatter. Well, certainly better than Zap Blatter. Um, and more honestly. <laughs> the fact is that he has a vision for the FAI, and he's had this for, for quite some time. As we know, he's heavily involved at uh, grassroots level, and he wants to see that succeed like you wouldn't believe. I think he understood uh, the politics of it, uh, which are worse than the Chinese Communist Party. So he understood. He wasn't naive. I mean, John came from that DNA group. His father was in it. He has definitely a great uh, wisdom. You know, I didn't get that from me, but he has a great uh, attitude to, to things, and he's very level-headed, you know. I'd, I'd be inclined to jump in. I think he make you know he makes up uh, different characters really. He's a a collage of people. I think he you've got the administrator, you know, the CEO, and then you have the sports buff, uh, and then you have the personal touch. to push on. I mean, the last 10 or 15 minutes then, if it's still, if it's still no score, or even 1-0. One, one yeah, he might as well. Yeah, but even at no score, he's better off to, to, to chase it aggressively and try and score. Oh, oh dear, oh dear. Oh dear, oh dear. Ah, OK. Yeah, well, when he comes up, then give me a shout. Well, yeah, I'm off to see the Queen tomorrow too, don't forget that. Two weeks before, he decided to come. So Joe and I travelled down to Waterford where he was to be, you know, the maternity hospital there. And Joe deposited me, as they did in those days, and he said, I'll go down to the Dominican church to say a prayer, and I'll be back in five minutes. So he got head up in traffic, and he came back anyway. And in half an hour after he left, John was born. First time I heard that. So he was back, Joe was back, and he was there and everything. So and that, uh, and that was the start. And then when he started to walk, he just didn't walk, he ran. What age was when he started walking or running? About a year. Remember in the kitchen in, in Thomas Town? I do well, yeah. It was a big long kitchen like this and he stood there and he got up on his feet and he just ran the whole way down. He wasn't a huge talker when he was, he went at three to school because it, it was convenient. We had a lot of children under him quickly and he Push went at three and he came home one day with a big bunch of daffodils. <laughs> Ma'am! <laughs> and Half an hour later, a woman came up the road and she said, Who took my daffodils? Was it your fella? I said, I don't know. I got a present of daffodils from somewhere. <laughs> and she laughed. Years ago, we used to have people calling to the door for stuff. You know, that was traditional. And we had always a few regulars. And one day, this itinerant came. <laughs> and the same one. And you'd give them the house and they'd never be satisfied. Like, And... She, I'd given her four or five bundles of stuff and the next thing was she said I need a little pair of shoes for my young fella you know and the next thing was I said John now was small and he didn't talk an awful lot at that stage I suppose he didn't get a chance with the rest of us and the next thing was I saw him sitting down taking off his shoes and handed them to the, <laughs> the itinerant but John was very soft like that When football came into the house if you like through me I was very involved with Waterford you know uh, which is 50 miles from here and on the Sundays when we'd travel to Waterford for every second week at home John would travel with me along with the players that were coming from Limerick Ritchie Hall late Ritchie Hall and Alf we What age was John then? He was about 14, 15 years of age so he, that's where he first got his initiation into League of Ireland football as it was then you know and uh, but John was committed to all games. I mean, John and I went to, uh, in the 70s, to about oh, seven or eight Leinster finals in a row in hurling, you know. When I, when I left school, all I wanted to do was get qualified as an accountant. I didn't know why, but it was just because there wasn't great career guidance in schools back then. And my dad had been, I'd done a bit of accountancy and everyone said it'd be a great qualification. I was good at accountancy. So I just went and got qualified. 
But when I got qualified, I wonder what, what am I going to do now? Because you, know? <laughs> yeah. you spend five or six years getting qualified, and then well, I've done that. But and what did you do? I went down to a bakery down in Kerry. There was a family bakery, part owned by our family and part owned by um, John the Baker. Yeah, yeah, not Pat the Baker, John the Baker. And I ran a bakery for a couple of years. So Were you any good? I didn't bake, I didn't bake, but I, I, I had to learn. I'll tell you, some of the best principles I've learned came from running that bakery. I remember going down the first week, there was £100,000 owed to the sheriff um, <laughs> in, in back taxes, and the health inspector was in within two weeks saying he was going to close the place. That's a fact. How did you deal with that? Well, I told so I know, I know feel for the bakery at times. So I told the health inspector if he wanted to, to lose 40 jobs in Kerry, that was his business. He lived in Kerry. And he backed off straight away. So you away. were clever enough to say that. So you're, you're aware of how to speak to these yeah, people. Well, I think it was a bit, there was a bit, of, a bit ballsy maybe, you know, but, but he didn't want to close it because there was 40 jobs and Kerry would have been gone. And the sheriff, I wrote 10 post data checks out for, for a year, 10 grand a month. And thankfully they all cleared. And we made a go of it then. We made a real go of it. So how did you go from the bakery? What, what happened then? The bakery, ooh, I got involved with a logistics company in Waterford. I was partly involved in a furniture shop in that loan from my dad as well. And I, I just took on different projects all the time, you know. We leased a pub in, in Tralee to us as well, and that went well. I enjoyed that. So you were doing a lot of different things? I was, yeah. I had a vending distribution company, had a coffee distribution company, had a bakery. The logistics company went very well. So I was doing all different. But see, the, you don't have the one thing I've learned. Like we built the stadium, the Viva Stadium, when I, when I got involved with the FAI. I think the same business principles apply to any business. So I didn't know how to build a stadium, I didn't know effectively how to run a pub, I knew the other side of the pub like any young lad, or a furniture shop or a logistics company, but when you learn the business. The Aviva Stadium was a grand idea, unfortunately for the FAI, and that's why they're in debt, uh, the economies of the world collapsed, and this one most spectacularly, so they were caught a bit by that, but he had the, the vision to see it, and uh, to go to the banks, uh, to create the ticket uh, schemes, to make it work financially. I think he comes from a business background. He's run businesses successfully, diverse businesses, difficult businesses. So I think the FAI are fortunate that we're, they were able to attract somebody of his calibre. And you know the fact that he also loves the game and is in the most ideal job for him, probably in his dreams, you know, it's a fairly good match. What did you see in him when you first met him? I thought he was very engaging. Um, you know, I think first impressions are always something that are important with somebody. And my impression of him that he was astute, he was smart, and he was ambitious for, you know, Irish football. There was so, many, so much infighting, so much difficulty, so much turmoil, so much grabs for power, call it what you like. And the evidence was the continuous, continuous rows, continuous indiscipline, continuous problems within the organisation. The, the, the sad thing in my time, you, you try to change something. And the fellows around the table, most of them were representing clubs or a faction in football. And once you proposed to change something, the answer came out very sharp. You could see them thinking, how is that going to affect my club? It might, be, it might be for the good of football, but that didn't matter to them. It was how it was going to affect my club. Joe uh, and Louis Klein were the original guys who wanted to modernise things. Look after the players, uh, stay in better hotels, don't go on dumb tours, stuff like that. Uh, um, but when John came in, he knew the, the landscape and he knew what needed to be done and he had the courage to do it. And what really needed to be done was, first of all, the players had to be respected. They had to have good training facilities. They had to stay in good hotels. After Saipan, where Roy Keane, you know, complained about sitting, uh, players sitting in the steering class. and you know, pitches and stuff like that. Yeah, but in, even in travel arrangements, they'd, be, they'd turn left when you were in the plane, and the players would turn right. And uh, they were in the lap of luxury. Saipan was a classic example of a, of a mess, uh, probably to save money. We were on a, a six-hour train journey from Poland to Berlin, and the train broke down. And we were playing the next day against Beckenbauer and Co. in Berlin. This was in 1973, I think, or in the early 70s. And... 
a carriage had to be removed. It was the one we were in, the FAI and the Blazers and us, the players. We were put in the luggage compartment, sitting on the floor for the six hour, for half the six hour journey while they stayed in their first class seats. That kind of stuff. <laughs> I became secretary first for the Water with United Football Club because my dad had been chairman of that in the years come by, so they asked me to join the board. So I became a member of the FAI National Council. Then I was voted onto the board of the FAI in 1999. Became the youngest treasurer of the FAI in 2001, I think at 33, 33 years of age. What shape was it in then? Badly ran. Very badly ran. Very badly ran organisation. Why was that? It would have been structured to fail because uh, it was cumbersome. There was over 20 people on the board, a lot of very good people who wanted to develop the game, but there would have been a lot of individual agendas brought to board level. Therefore, you know, you could never get strategy. You could never get um, decisions that were made on an issue based, which is really, really important. Everything was based on what's best for my portion of the game, what's best for my part of the game, or in some cases, what's best for, for me. Uh, and that's changed completely now because what, I, what I've tried to do with the support of, the, of a smaller board is make everything issue based, not personality based, and the maximum of what's best for Irish football. So how did you move up the ranks then? I was only treasurer then for, for, for a year or two, a couple of years. And then in 2004 there was a vacancy. The members asked me to take the role. The members did. And then the government set up an interview committee of five people. There was three from the government and two from the FAI. So you're there 10 years? There 10 years now, yeah. Did you have a vision as a moderniser? I did. And amazing, when I first came in as honorary treasurer in 2001, I said to a couple of people, this place is a mess. And we just qualified for the World Cup. And I remember a couple of very important people in the organisation said to me, look, you'll have no chance to change this organisation next year because we're going to the World Cup. After the World Cup, you might have some chance. But little did we know that the events of the World Cup allowed people like myself to step forward and change the organisation because Saipan was a watershed moment for the FAI. It allowed people like myself, Michael Cody and many other people at the time to call for the change, which was badly, badly, badly required. So I won't say it was a blessing in disguise, but it certainly was a watershed moment, no doubt about that. Sometimes you've got to hit the bottom of the barrel before you can rise. Sometimes you have to. And I think what Saipan gave people like myself who want to reform the association, the excuse or the momentum to drive the organisation forward to say, listen, this cannot continue. Because Saipan was really just a snapshot of other ills in the organisation. Okay? Like what? Like how it was run. Generally how it was run. I'd say that unequivocally, how it was the governance of how it was run. So Saipan was a snapshot of how, in my opinion, the malaise in the organisation, how it was run at national level. And as a result, we were able to call for reform and implement reform because at that stage there was very few obstacles to reform given the nature of how, how Saipan had exercised not only the Irish public but the world public and nobody, no organisation, no organisation, no matter how big or how small, could say, listen, Saipan was just an accident, let, it, let, it, let, it just, let, let life just continue and let's plot along as we were. No way, that couldn't happen. The public expected a reaction. I think a lot of people in the football public wanted to see the reforms and the catalyst for those reforms was this <laughs> crazy island out in the whatever specific which I've never been to but that was the catalyst. With manager Mick McCarthy leaving in November Ireland was in the wilderness for a few years with Steve Staunton and before that Brian Kerr until in 2008 John Delaney got a phone call from Dennis O'Brien. Well, I came across John having watched a game. I think we were beaten by Norway or Cyprus 4-0. And I rang up uh, I rang up Kieran Mulvey and I said, Kieran, do you have John Delaney's number? And he said, why? I said, you know, are they going to change managers? And if they are, do they want a sponsor? And then I had Eddie Jordan yakking yeah. in my ear like every five minutes. Ring him, ring him, ring him. And uh, eventually I got in touch with John. John thought it was a spoof, first of all. And eventually we had a conversation, then we met up. And, you know, I said to him, look, if you're ever considering, you know, really getting so a top-notch European manager, wherever they're from, uh, and you need a sponsor, I said, I'd be interested in doing it. You know what I mean? And 
then he came back to me and he said, look, we may be making a change. You know, we may have to go fairly heavy to get a very good manager. In that case, it was Trapattoni. But I actually didn't have a view on who they would, uh, who he was going to employ because that would be really dangerous. Yeah. All I just said, look, I'm good for it if you need the help. And when he came back to me and said, yeah, we're going to go with somebody. And then he told me Trapattoni. And I said, Jesus, that's, that's heavy. Yeah. Uh, and they went and hired uh, Trapattoni and Tardelli. And it was a good combination. Yeah, was, for example, they'd always go for the cheapest manager. You know, or the Trap Tony had the best CV in the world. He was expensive, 1.8 million, which was probably the biggest salary of any coach in Europe or close to it. Uh, now, the FEI before John Lennon would have balked at that. Uh, and even though Trap Tony didn't work out, um, in, in my opinion, although he got us to, you know, he got us to the Euro 2012 finals, he didn't really work out. But the cost of him, Tardelli, the backup team, Liam Brady was in there. To take that on was brave. It showed ambition as well. It, it showed ambition and vision. We're going now. We need a new manager. We're going for the best guy in the world. And they, they got him. I, I, I have an affection for him, you know, because he is this great legend in football, isn't he? He just didn't come to manage Ireland. Look what he did in football before, playing in two, you know, winning two European Cups, Mark and Pelé, his incredible success as a manager. And you've got to respect all of that. And... But by and large, he did, he did a very good job for us. I always tell the one about Trapper, we were down in Tremor and there was no media presence, about four or five hundred there, club of the year, and we're all in the room having to crack. And we had a thing that I'd tell a few stories with a mic, but the trap would come up and speak, and so I'm up telling a few stories. And I said, now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to the Irish international manager, Giovanni Trapattoni. And he takes the mic and he says, excuse me, excuse me, my English is no so good, no so good. I did on my it wasn't so fucking bad when you were doing the wages. <laughs> <laughs> because my father always said to me, if you smile, you know, you're not carrying the weight in your or in your shoulders. Nothing by your health is not resolvable. Did you smile when Ireland got hammered against Germany? Absolutely not, you know. I mean you only smiled when the final whistle was over, so you could you know, you I mean I could have been anything. We were six down at one stage. Uh, and that's a difficult time, you know, but even that night you have to entertain some customers, like you know, three and all our sponsors. The following morning, I had to go to Wicklow. That poor lad who died, who was drowned um, at the Euros, we had to go to a commemorative match for him. Later at night, I had to go to Cork, carry a line for, for their dinner dance, and get up on Sunday morning and get on the plane to go to the Faroe Islands. So, in the midst of all that, and there was a lot of panic, the media had gone berserk, everybody's looking for you, we lost the game 6 1. But Saturday was work. You had to be at the commemorative match, I give my word. Had to be in Carrigaline that night. Get up early Sunday morning, straight to a plane after the Pharaohs, you know. And the only laugh I got to people saying to me, you know, how you feel? And I said, actually, it was my birthday the night we were playing the Pharaohs, you know. And I, and I was saying, my one line was, well, I don't know whether I'm going to have a good birthday or an awful birthday. Did you <laughs> yeah. have a good day, a birthday or an awful birthday? <laughs> when the game was over, yeah. You know, you have, you have good days and you have bad days in football. And, you know, okay, losing by that margin was a tough one to 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 swallow but it just at that stage we just weren't playing well for whatever reason uh, and you know to lose by that margin wasn't great uh, but I think you know for every manager has a period of time with a team and sometimes that comes to an end you know it, you know there was many years of great performances that Trapattoni had got out of the team so Look, these all the good things have to come to an end. Do you think you waited too long to sack Trapattoni? No, I, th I don't think so. I think, look, he had qualified us for the Euros. He had got us to the World Cup almost the time before with the Henri Handball. So he'd done two very good qualification tournaments. The last time round, um, we, were, we, we still had an opportunity playing Sweden at home to qualify. Had we beaten Sweden at home in that September, we could still have got to the playoffs. No question about that. So immediately in that weekend, we lost to Sweden, lost to Austria. It had to finish then. But you don't leave a manager go when you still have a, a really good chance of qualification. We were a goal up against Sweden. Had we beaten Sweden and got a draw against Austria, we were in pole position for playoff. And that would have been a success to, to get that far and then see who we got. 
So I think you've always got to back your manager on such time as it becomes, you know, impossible or almost impossible um, to qualify. So I think, I think we did the right thing. I think we left him go at the right time. After he left, you were in Italy for a wedding. Did, did you did you meet him over there? No, 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 no. I mean, we left that morning. And it was it was kind of like an extraordinary. But a few days later, you were over in Italy for a wedding. No, it was the same day. Yeah, the same day. It was an extraordinary period of time because we lost to Austria, and we we came back to Dublin. Uh, we met in the the airport lounge. There are these famous airport lounges now. And that morning, we we agreed to to part company. I immediately got on a plane. Immediately got on a plane. For a private engagement, though. Yeah, for a private, but immediately did. Uh, and it was quite extraordinary. Did, did a few interviews with Pat Kenny and all that. Then when I landed in Frankfurt, on the way to, to Florence, as it turned out. But then it struck me, for about a half an hour, as I was preparing to get my second plane to Frankfurt, I was having a cup of coffee. And, and here you are on your own. <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> I'm not it's kind, of, kind of serene. You're, in, you're on your own here in Frankfurt. And you know, back in Ireland... This is, you know, huge news, you know, that, 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 you know, finally Trapattoni is gone and blah, blah, blah. And I also knew that the, the Irish football media were flying back. They were in the air, actually. So as, as they were flying back in the air, we, we had obviously done, um, done, done our range with, with Giovanni. But for that half an hour, just sitting, having a cup of coffee, going on to a different world, which was a wedding in, in Florence, which I'd agreed to do maybe a year before. Um, there's a serenity about it, a madness, that you, here you are having dealt with such a big topic back in Ireland and everybody would want you know, a piece of you, want to know about it. If I walked down the street in Dublin that day, people would have stopped you, you know. The appointment of Martin O'Neill with a certain man from Cork as his assistant would have Ireland talking even more than Trapp's departure. very important that Martin would be our manager. We always wanted Martin O'Neill to be our manager. Someone scored. Well, eventually, Martin had to be known that he was interested in a meeting. And at that meeting, when I met him, <laughs> that was the night he told me that he'd like to bring Roy as number two. And what was your reaction? Not a problem. <laughs> Not a problem. What was the reaction when you mentioned Roy Keane to him? Um, that was that was interesting uh, in the sense that I, I was wondering how he would take it, uh, but you know he didn't bat an eyelid. He said, "You're the manager. If this is the uh, if this is what you want as an assistant, and and uh, Roy's the man, I have no problem with that." And that is as genuine as, as 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 I'm saying it now. He didn't because I think it was for the the greater good. And he felt then um, that you know, this was a, 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 a partnership that hopefully he, he could feel could work. Not, not for him, he would put uh, ego aside from that viewpoint and, and say that, well, listen, if, if this is exactly what you want and you feel that Roy is going to be helpful, that, would be, uh, that was fine by him. He's, uh, he, he is uh, an iconic figure, Roy. He is also, um, he, he can divide the country as well too, as, you know, namely Saipan in what 2002. Was your, what, what was your view on that? Uh, my, my view, as I've always said to him, I think he should have played. He has given the reasons why he didn't do. I respect those. I'm, well, I, for the first question is, well, why, why is Martin going to do that? You know, that it was kind of a surprise that he would go left field and bring Roy in as the assistant manager. And then when you really think it through, it makes an awful lot of sense because Roy obviously was one of the greatest players of all time. Um, he is much loved in half the country and other parts of the country. People are still saying, well, what about Saipan? Uh, but as a football person, you know, nobody, you couldn't find any better than Roy Keane. He's pure box office. He is pure box office. And so... You know, having the, you know, both Martin, who's a terrific manager, a lot of success with Celtic and other clubs, going back to even to Leicester City, you'd have to say that's a pretty good combination. Because I believe the manager should appoint his own people. And it was about time when I do his reconciliation. Part of the reconciliation was a dinner in the Unicorn restaurant in Dublin with Roy, Martin and John. Well, the, the, there was a bit of everything that evening and it was all taken, I think, 
in good spirits. But sometimes I'm never sure about that because I, I might leave the table having started some sort of conversation feeling that actually simply because I enjoyed it, that it meant that uh, all around the table enjoyed my, my conversation. In fact, quite often I, I, I realise that all I've done is just kind of started a commotion really. But that wasn't that evening. Definitely it was very, very good fun and it was something that, um, something that was, that, that was uh, pretty good considering, uh, considering the, um, the people around the table. He knew the, the way the FBI worked. And he knew he was a shrewd politician, a shrewd operator. That, that's actually on the pitch after Ireland lost to Italy in the World Cup quarter final in 1990. And Jack, Jack wouldn't go out of the pitch. Jack was devastated that lost the game. So Dad got Hottie, Charlie Hottie, to go out of the pitch to keep the crowd entertained, if you like, before Jack came out afterwards. And Hottie loved it. I mean, he absolutely adored it. And he was waving to everybody. What's your own politics, John? Mine? None really, honestly. Because I tell you, I work with all different parties now for, for the good of football. Would you ever go into politics? No. I mean, people say never, say never, but I've been asked to do it. No, Barry. Who's no. asked you? I was asked by a Fianna Fáil minister in Croke Park one day, would I run um, in either South Tipperary or Waterford, and in one tenth of a second. No, no. When was that? That would have been, oh, would have been oh, seven or eight around that time. And, and he meant it now, it wasn't a throwaway, it wasn't a throwaway, but it wouldn't be for me. You know, football, I love football, I, I just love football, I've loved it since I was born. Uh, will I stay in all my life? Probably not, because, you know, that might not be afforded to you, the opportunity to stay in all your life. But I love it, it's a passion and it gives me energy and drive. I mean, no, no day is work to me, it's just doing your hobby. Did you also meet Michael Noonan? You were on your knees with Michael Noonan in the church. How long you time obviously ago? still go to Mass then. Well, you meet all the politicians when you're, when you're opening pitches. Was there a bit of a conversation in the church? Yeah, it was, it was a funny one. I, 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 have a, I have a lot of time for him actually, I really have a lot of time for him. I've heard him speak, I think he speaks a lot of common sense and he puts it in a very concise way. So I asked him in church, we were opening the pitch after us and a club or something, I asked him, you know, how's the economy going? He said, he, he said, while the Germans are on your back and the price of diesel is going up, we're in trouble. Well, it's fantastic, Barry, when you drive through here, whatever day it is. Uh, it's like chalk and cheese, Marine Square, an old Georgian building in the middle of Dublin, to um, a fantastic campus here, you know, and uh, they'll be finished in December, open next, next April, and then that's another, you know, Landmark Day for the Association because these offices, as you see now, we're pulling in are for administration and that's completely required. But it's all about the kids playing, it's all about getting children to play, it's all about elite football out here as well. So to have the pitches um, is a landmark day and it, it completes the campus for us because having the offices is brilliant. But ultimately, what's football about? It's about being on the pitch, kicking the round ball. To make sure that you know all the clubs develop in a certain way, the coaching is you know uniform and the way they can identify players that have the ability to go on to the next level as such and the way they've done that has been systematic and really really well organized and when you meet the clubs you know I'm involved in St James's in Dublin because my son plays for him you know they all recognize that at a grassroots level the FAI have done a brilliant job. You never know the future Barry you never know you could get knocked down by a bus tomorrow morning you can only hope for the future that's i've always said that you know but you need to have plans every year in my diary i in december at the back end of december i write down what's been achieved in the previous year and what you want to do for the following year and every year over christmas i look at that diary and say did you do all those things and if i haven't hit and delivered on some of them you'd be very very disappointed the future from now is obviously we've got georgia I want us to qualify for France in 2016. That's what I want us to do for, for me as an Irish man, for my country. Uh, I want to complete the uh, academy here by the end of December, which we will do, open it in the new year. That's a big objective. On the 19th of September, we're one of the 13 cities who are bidding for the Euros to host in 2020. That would be an incredible thing for this country to host that, an incredible thing. And if we can achieve that, I would be absolutely over the moon. Will you be president of FIFA then? <laughs> I don't think so. Blatter will probably still be alive. <laughs>